Talking about disorders of the upper GI tract and gastric disorders, um, there, is just, there are just volumes of uh, things in the book that we're not going to go into great detail about. We're going to talk about some of them, some of them that are um, really uh, often seen in PT or closely related to what we're doing. Um, there, I'm, there's a lot of information in this PowerPoint that I'm going to gloss over, um, just briefly hit on, and move on to the next thing. We're going to talk a little bit in more depth about dysphagia because that comes up a lot in the patients that we treat. So um, there are also lots of really wonderful, gruesome pictures in the book that you are welcome to look at all you want. I didn't include them in the PowerPoint because um, there's only so much looking at those pictures that you can do. When uh, my sister and I were in high school, um, she wasn't really a very much of a science-minded person. Um, but she, she had me in 10th grade biology, she had me go through her biology book and tape index cards over the pictures that she classified as gross, um, so she wouldn't have to look at them. So, um, you know, if you want to look at gross pictures, be my guest. There are days when I could look at gross pictures all day, and there are days when I'm not really liking it. But the, um, just like the skin chapter, the digestive system chapter has plenty of gross pictures to look at. So, um, disorders of the oral cavity, obviously these can affect um, dentition, mastication, um, the breakdown of foods, um, it can, and um, you can, it can be the entryway for um, infections. So they list a whole bunch of them, congenital abnormalities, inflammatory lesion, lesions, infections. I'm not going to go through every one of these, um, but they're here for your perusal. Um, several different um, infections can cause oral lesions, and a lot of times that's where they're detected because that's what you can see. Um, if they're causing internal digestive lesions, you can't see those. So I guess maybe the oral lesions are a good thing because they help you identify and then treat the, the illness. So um, dental problems can cause problems with nutrition as well because it um, inhibits chewing and um, the processing of food, basically. So I'm not going to go through all these. <laughs> These are, they're all in here just for your information, but I'm not going through them. Cancer, of course, can develop in any system, and it can also um, develop in the oral cavity. So when you have regular dental treatments, um, the dentist always checks for um, possible cancels, cancers of the oral cavity. So another good reason why um, we want to go in and get our regular uh, dental checkups. You can have salivary gland disorders, um, including infectious and non-infectious disorders. You can also have tumors of the salivary gland. And those can affect digestion because that is the first part in the breakdown, is the, that salivary um, input into the um, breakdown of food. Um, dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. It can be caused by a neurological deficit, like you had a stroke. Um, it can be caused by a muscular disorder, so you can have um, problems with the muscles of swallowing. It can be caused by a mechanical obstruction, like a tumor. Um, so it can present a lot of different ways. It can present as pain with swallowing. So, you know, like you have a sore throat, painful with swallowing. Um, it can be the inability to swallow larger pieces of solid material. There is a test that speech pathologists do that's called a modified barium swallow, where they um, have several different textures and types of food um, that are mixed with barium. They um, have the patient eat and swallow them, um, and it's recorded. Um, the radiograph is recorded, and they can see um, if the swallowing processes are normal, and if they have trouble with larger pieces or solid material or liquids, difficulty swallowing liquids is a, another form of dysphagia. Um, a lot of times when you work in an inpatient setting, people will be on modified diets because of dysphagia. They will have to either have their food mechanically processed, so um, they it's broken down into smaller pieces, or um, they can't have liquids. So most inpatient, in most inpatient setting, the um, 
Speech pathologist or nutritionist recommendation for food modifications will be posted in the patient's room. So if you're working with the patient and they go, boy, I could really use a glass of water, check that sheet, make sure that they're allowed to drink liquids because they could aspirate and end up with aspiration pneumonia and we don't want to do that. So um, the neurological deficits that can cause dysphagia include infections affecting the nervous system, um, stroke, brain damage, um, failure of the lower esophageal sphinct uh, sphincter to relax because of lack of innervation. So that's like a muscular problem. Um, and you can have impairment from muscular dystrophy of the swallowing muscles. So the, um, the muscles of swallowing are just like our, our other skeletal muscles, even though they're tied into some different um, neurological cycles. Um, but you can have the same problems with swallowing muscles that you have with other muscles. Sometimes a mechanical obstruction can be caused by a developmental um, abnormality where the upper and lower esophageal segments are separated. Um, it can be caused by stenosis, which is a narrowing of the esophagus. So stenosis in anything is narrowing. So you can have um, stenosis in a lot of different parts of your body. Um, Esophageal stenosis can be developmental or acquired. Um, it might be secondary to fibrosis, chronic inflammation, and ulceration or radiation therapy to treat cancer. Um, a stenosis or a stricture may also result from scar tissue, and it might require um, treatment with repeated mechanical dilation. That's the one I was talking about in the last section where they do the endoscopy and they open up that stricture. Um, one time I worked with someone who had uh, esophageal cancer and actually had to have part of the esophagus removed. Um, so it's sort of like the um, developmental um, anomaly where the upper and lower esophageal segments are separated. We actually can't swallow. Um, the person that I was working with that had the esophageal cancer couldn't swallow, had to be on... Um, a feeding tube basically that went directly into their um, intestine. Um, he liked, he didn't like the feeling of his mouth being dry so he would, he liked to rinse out his mouth with water and then spit it out. He couldn't swallow it. Um, when we were working on uh, mobility and he was getting ready to go home when um, he was in the hospital. So um, people can go home on tube feeding. Um, it's a uh, Definitely not a preferred situation, but it basically your choice is tube feeding or starving to death um, at, at that um, juncture. So um, sometimes you have options and sometimes you don't. Um, there are also cranial nerves involved in swallowing, and um, if those are affected, that can um, cause problems as well. So mechanical obstruction can be caused from... Um, esophageal diverticula, which are out pouchings of the esophageal wall. There's some um, pictures in the book of um, those, which are pretty interesting. Um, sometimes it's a, it's congenital. Sometimes it's acquired following an inflammatory process. It causes um, irritation, inflammation, and scar tissue. And signs of it include um, dysphagia, bad breath because um, Food can stay in those uh, little pockets and uh, rot, basically. Um, a chronic cough and hoarseness. So tumors, whether they're internal to the esophagus or external, can also cause dysphagia. So here are, here's one of the less gross pictures from the book and just some different um, causes in the esophagus of dysphagia. So esophageal cancer is usually squamous cell carcinomas, primarily. Um, usually it's in the distal esophagus, so closer to the mouth. Um, there can be significant dysphagia in later stages because the um, carcinoma can actually close off the esophagus. Um, a lot of times it's a poor prognosis because of late manifestations. This is the case with a lot of digestive system cancers because um, you, don't you don't have any symptoms until you have a blockage, basically. So um, esophageal cancer can be associated with chronic irritation because of either um, chronic inflammation of the esophagus 
um, the closure of the esophageal sphincter. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word. I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> Hiatal hernia, um, which we'll talk about. And alcohol abuse or smoking can also cause chronic inflammation and irritation of the esophagus, and it can result in esophageal cancer. So um, you can end up like that guy who um, wasn't able to swallow and just had to rinse his mouth out with water. So hiatal hernia is where part of the stomach protrudes into the thoracic cavity. Um, the food can lodge in that um, pouch of the hernia and it can cause inflammation of the mucosa and reflux of food up the esophagus. And it may cause chronic esophagitis, which then can lead to um, esophageal cancer. So um, the signs can be heartburn or pyrosis, is another word for heartburn, um, frequent belching, um, increased discomfort when lying down, and substernal pain that might radiate to the shoulder and jaw. So what does that sound like? Substernal pain that radiates to the shoulder and jaw? Sounds like a heart attack, right? So some of these symptoms, um, it really requires good differential diagnosis skills from the physician in order to um, differentiate between a hiatal hernia and a heart attack. Um, it's a good thing to know <laughs> you have that. So if you have someone that you're working with, no matter what reason you're working with or what setting, if they have a hiatal hernia, you probably do not want to lie them down. Um, so you want to, if you have to do supine exercises or have them supine for whatever reason, you might want to put them on a wedge. Um, or um, if you have them in a hospital bed, you want to raise the head of the bed to um, prevent some of those uh, problems with hiatal hernia. Um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, um, is another thing that you want to avoid lying people supine with. So when it's periodic reflux of the gastric contents into the esophagus, causing erosion and inflammation. Um, it's often seen in conjunction with the hiatal hernia, because the hiatal hernia causes the reflux. Um, the severity depends on how well that lower esophageal sphincter can hold together. Um, sometimes it can be caused by delayed gastric emptying um, because that it takes a long time for the chyme to get out of the um, stomach. You can have reflux in the meantime. So a lot of times with GERD, um, people are uh, advised to avoid caffeine, fatty or spicy foods because um, fatty foods take longer to digest and spicy foods can be more irritating. Um, alcohol, because it can be irritating smoking, also irritating, and certain drugs. Um, the use of medication can reduce reflux and inflammation. So a lot of the, um, the uh, things that uh, decrease stomach acid, the heartburn type um, medications are used for GERD. And again, positioning is important for our patients with GERD. If you look in somebody's medical record and it says they have GERD, just pay attention to how you position them. Um, if they just tell you, oh, I have um, reflux, don't lie them down. Don't, you know, don't uh, make them more uncomfortable. Gastritis can be acute or chronic. Gastritis means inflammation of the stomach. The gastric mucosa is inflamed. It can be ulcerated and bleeding. It can result from a million different things. Infection, allergies, spicy or irritating foods, excessive alcohol intake, ingestion of aspirin or other NSAIDs, um, ingestion of corrosive or toxic substances, usually by mistake, I'm guessing, and radiation or chemotherapy. So usually the signs of gastrointestinal irritation are those signs we already talked about. Anorexia, nausea, vomiting, um, hematemesis, so um, blood in the vomit, um, epigastric pain, so pain around the stomach, cramps or general discomfort. With infection, diarrhea may develop. Um, acute gastritis is usually self-limiting because you can get complete regeneration of the gastric mucosa after it subsides. Um, usually if somebody has prolonged vomiting or in some cases diarrhea, supportive treatment by giving the person fluids, preventing those electrolyte and um, acid-base imbalances. Sometimes they require treatment with antimicrobial drugs, drugs if it's caused by a microbe. Chronic gastritis is um, where it's gone beyond um, the point where it can heal. It's, there's actually atrophy of the stomach mucosa. Um, there's loss of um, secretory glands and reduced production of intrinsic factors, so that's going to affect your B12 metabolism. Um, a lot of times the bacterium Helicobacter pylori is present. 
Um, this is also the case with gastric ulcers. Um, that um, particular bacterium is often a um, one of the baddies involved in this. The signs can be vague um, with chronic gastritis. It can be mild epigastric discomfort, um, lack of appetite, intolerance for certain foods. There's an increased risk of peptic ulcers and gastric carcinoma. And certain autoimmune disorders are associated with one type of chronic gastric atrophy. So autoimmune disorders can get any tissue in your body, and this happens to be just another one. With gastroenteritis, um, the difference between gastritis and gastroenteritis is gastritis in, um, involves the stomach, and gastroenteritis involves the stomach and intestine. Usually gastroenteritis is caused by infection, but it can also be caused by allergic reaction to food or drugs. So um, a lot of times gastroenteritis is caused by microbes transmitted by fecally contaminated food, soil, or water. A lot of times the infections are self-limiting, but serious illness up to and including death may result in a compromised host or, or super virulent organisms. So the E. coli that kills people, those are the super virulent organisms. If you have a compromised host, like a young person, a little kid whose immune system is not developed, or another person that has immunodeficiency for one reason or another, um, this type of microbe can cause epidemic outbreaks in um, refugee or disaster settings. That's why water treatment is so important. So safe sanitation, um, safe drinking water, and separation of um, the uh, toilet facilities from food and water um, is essential per for preventing these kind of outbreaks. So list of lots of different infections that can be transmitted by food and water and what their incubation is and the manifestations of them. So um, they can be baddies. Um, the, the E. coli traveler's diarrhea, um, I have a story about that. <laughs> we went to uh, San Francisco for a long weekend, visited with some of our friends, and we had a great time. We went, ate at an Ethiopian restaurant. I'm saying that's where I got it, but my um, husband and friends didn't get any of it. Um, but w within a few hours of eating there, um, I had good old vomiting diarrhea, and um, it was it pretty much ruined the trip, and I couldn't eat <laughs> that well for um, a couple weeks after that. I was I was drinking Pedialyte um, for a long time, and um, it was self-limiting. So I was, uh, you know, like a reasonably healthy immune system, a reasonably healthy host, and um, it, you know, my doctor just said, "I'll oh, make sure you stay hydrated and um, drink Pedialyte and." slowly add foods back into your diet. Um, so with a hopefully not as virulent um, microorganism and a healthy host, it's self-limiting. With a um, immunocompromised host um, or a, a less healthy host for whatever reason, um, or a more virulent strain of organism, it could have been a different story. So E. coli is usually harmless. It's, a usu it's usually resident in our, in our intestine. It hangs out, um, but there are infective strains, there's a whole list of them here, um, that ca can cause significant problems. Um, ulcers, you can get gastric and duodenal ulcers, and they're usually caused by that Helicobacter pylori bacterium. Um, it breaks down the mucosal barriers, barrier, so you have decreased mucosal defense. And um, damage to the mucosal barrier predisposes development of ulcers. Um, so ulcers are usually associated with inadequate blood supply caused by vasoconstriction. So there are lots of different things that can cause vasoconstriction. And it interferes with the regeneration of the epithelium after it's been um, broken down by uh, Helicobacter pylori. Um, excessive glucocorticoid uh, secretion from the adrenal glands or glucocorticoid medications can predispose you to gastric or duodenal ulcers. Um, ulcerogenic substances like aspirin, NSAIDs, and alcohol can break down the mucus layer as well. Um, and the atrophy of the gastric mucosa from chronic gastritis can predispose you to ulcers. 
So um, these are just from, it's from the book, Common Locations of Gastric Ulcers. Um, a lot of times it's near the pyloric sphincter because um, that's where the, um, there's a lot of acidic activity going on um, and the um, acids stay longer in that area. And if you have bacterial activity going on, um, they are, uh, the bacteria, a lot of times the contents of the stomach are below the fundus and so um, stuff's going to be going on more down in that lower area or the lower part of the esophagus or the upper part of the duodenum just because mechanically how it's situated. So um, complications of peptic ulcers can be hemorrhage, um, perforation, and then you're um, a possible victim of peritonitis, um, or obstruction. Um, because of the formation of scar tissue. So um, ulcers can start out uh, pretty small and they can end up being pretty bad things that can kill you. Um, signs and symptoms are usually epigastric burning or localized pain, usually followed by stomach emptying, following stomach emptying, excuse me. So you eat a meal, you feel okay for a while, and then you have the epigastric burning or pain after the stomach empties itself out. Um, they diagnose ulcers with endoscopies, um, barium x-rays, or um, biopsies during the endoscopy. Um, usually they're treated with antimicrobial drugs to eliminate helicobacter, helicobacter pylori or a proton pump inhibitor, which is another medication. Um, and it's treated by reducing exacerbating factors, so you don't eat things or drink things that make it worse. Stress ulcers are often associated with severe trauma or systemic problems like burns, um, hemorrhage, or sepsis. A lot of times they're rapid onset, usually multiple gastric ulcers form within hours of a precipitating event. Um, and the, a lot of times the first indicator is hemorrhage or severe pain. So it's not bad enough that you had a burn or a head injury or sepsis, but then you end up with this secondary problem as well. So this is a picture from the book. I guess I did include some of the gross pictures, but here we go. Of multiple stress ulcers of the stomach. So there are those little black areas, and the black is from um, bleeding. Gastric cancer, just like anything, any area of the body can get cancer. Um, it usually happens in the mucous glands. Um, so early carcinoma is usually confined to the mucosa and the submucosa. Later stages, it starts to invade the muscular layers um, and eventually into the serosa and it can spread to the lymph nodes. So just like a lot of other digestive cancers, it's asymptomatic in the early stages. And so the prognosis is often poor on diagnosis because it's not detected until the later stages. It's not detected until it invades the serosa and spreads to the lymph nodes and causes problems and other symptoms. Um, diet seems to be a key factor in gastric cancer, particularly smoked foods, nitrates, and nitrites. So, um, that, you know, that's something to think about. If you like uh, smoked herring, I don't know, that's the only smoked food I could think of. <laughs> Maybe you want to uh, eat it in moderation. Genetic influences also play a role. Genetic influences play a big role in how cancer is going to metastasize. And um, so that's something to think about, too. Um, a lot of times, the symptoms are vague until the cancer is very advanced. That's why it's, you often get late diagnosis. It's usually treated with um, chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation, but low survival rate, less than 20%, because of its late diagnosis. So digestive system cancers are insidious. They don't, sneak, they don't have a lot of symptoms until they're much later staged. And by that time, you have a worse prognosis and a, a harder time getting rid of it. Dumping syndrome is um, our normal gastric emptying um, is controlled by um, nervous system and hormonal controls. So for some reason, um, nervous or hormonal, the control of gastric emptying is lost and the gastric contents are just dumped into the duodenum without complete digestion. A lot of times it's after surgery that you get this. Um, so 
the um, chime hasn't been fully, it hasn't gone through its complete digestion. Um, and so it, now it's sucking fluids from the vascular compartment into the intestine. It causes intestinal distension and increased intestinal mobility and decreased blood pressure because it's sucking fluids from other areas, which can lead to anxiety and syncope, which is fainting. A lot of times it occurs shortly after meals. That makes sense, right? Because you get stuff in your stomach and then it dumps into the intestine. Um, abdominal cramps, nausea, and diarrhea can be symptoms of this. Hypo, um, hypoglycemia, um, two or three hours after the meal because high blood glucose levels in the chime stimulate increased insulin secretion and it drops blood glucose levels. Um, a lot of times dietary changes, frequent small meals that are high in protein and low in simple carbohydrates help resolve this and it resolves itself over time. Thank goodness. Pyloric stenosis, just like any stenosis, is narrowing and potentially obstruction of the pyloric sphincter at the bottom of the stomach. Um, it may be a developmental anomaly, or it may be um, resulting from other things. So if it's developmental, the signs appear within several weeks after birth, um, projectile vomiting immediately after feeding. That sounds quite unpleasant. Sometimes they can palpate a firm mass at the pylorus, the bottom of the stomach. And you get um, the infant failing to gain weight. They get dehydrated and persistent hunger because they're not getting the nutrients that they need. And surgery may be required to remove the obstruction. If, they, if you get it later in life, um, the symptoms tend to be a persistent feeling of fullness and increased incidence of vomiting. 